So now we're ready to begin day one. And our keynote speaker is Dr. Dan Tagley. Uh, uh, Dr. Tagley, can you please share your screen so we can get started? There we go. Okay. So. Okay. Can you see good. it? Yes, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. good. Thank you very much. Um, so Dr. Tan Tagley is Associate Director of the Office for Special Initiatives at the National Center for Advanced Translational Sciences, NCATS, at the NIH. He leads several trans-NIH programs, including the NIH Microphysiological Systems Program, also known as the Tissue Chip Program, the Extracellular RNA Communication Program, a program called SPARC, which stands for Stimulating Peripheral Activity to Relieve Conditions, the 3D Bioprinting Program, and another program called ASPIRE, which stands for a Specialized Platform for Innovative Research Exploration. And lastly, a new program called SENT, Scanning Conditions Using Electronic Nose Technology. So these programs all involve coordination with other NIH institutes and centers, other government agencies such as FDA, DARPA, NASA, the VA, and BARDA, which is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority in the Department of Health and Human Services, Services and also with the private sector. Prior to joining NCATS, Dr. Tagley was a program director for neurogenetics at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, where he developed programs in genomics-based research in inherited brain disorders. Prior to joining NINDS, he was a section head of molecular neurogenetics at the National Human Genome Research Institute, involved in efforts towards cloning genes for Huntington's disease and other neurologic diseases. He has more than 150 scientific publications and has garnered numerous awards and patents. Welcome, Dr. Tagley. We're looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you so much, uh, Pat, uh, for the invitation to speak uh, this morning and certainly to, uh, for the kind introduction and, and also for the other organizers uh, for this meeting. Um, so as Pat had mentioned, I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit more about NCATS and, and uh, some of the programs that I lead uh, within the NIH. Um, so, so just to give you a little bit of background about uh, NCAS or the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, uh, this is a newly created uh, uh, institute within, within the NIH that started uh, in late 2011. It's a bit different from the rest of the institutes and centers at the NIH in, in, in the sense that we are not necessarily disease focused uh, or, or organ specific in our mission. Uh, but our central mission is, is essentially to catalyze a generation of innovative methods and technologies uh, that will enhance the development, testing, and implementation of diagnostics and therapeutics across many human diseases and conditions. Uh, and so essentially, we're, we're looking at some of the, the bottlenecks or some of the areas uh, where translation is being held back and, and being able to innovate uh, technologies that will address those issues. Uh, so in, in regards to the tissue chips program uh, for drug screening, uh, or otherwise known also as microphysiological systems, uh, the translational problem we're trying to address is essentially the, the high attrition rate uh, of uh, drugs entering into clinical trials. So as, as shown here, uh, only about 12% uh, um, of, 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 of drugs uh, enter into trials, and, and the high attrition rate is essentially because of uh, high failure um, due to lack of efficacy, about 55%, and 28% can be attributed to uh, toxic effects in humans. Uh, moreover, it, uh, the average time it takes to develop a drug takes 10 to 15 years at the average cost of $2.6 billion, uh, including the cost of failures. Um, so it, it, it's becoming clear that the current tools uh, being used for drug development that includes 2D cell culture systems, uh, and, and uh, animal models are poor predictors of human response. Although they have been useful in the past, uh, they're not necessarily predictive of, of the human uh, condition. And so the program goal of the tissue chips or microphysiological systems is to develop an in vitro platform uh, that uh, emulates your organ physiology and function using uh, human and animal cells and tissues with advances 
uh, in stem cell biology, microfluidics, bioengineering, uh, that will result in the evaluation of efficacy, safety, and toxicity of promising ther therapies. Um, so this is just a, a rendering of what it looks like. So we, we take the functional element, let's say, of an organ, let's, such as the lung, which is the alve alveolus, um, represent that in, in um, uh, including the, the biomechanics of the air sacs breathing in and out uh, through vacuum channels, um, and then being able to produce that in a chip. And eventually, we would like to represent each organ on the body with, with a, a functional element of the organs into a human body and a uh, human body on a chip system. I mean, obviously, as there, there is going to be some some um, limitations in a sense as as we go from two D cell culture systems to spheroids, organoids, three uh, D bioprinted uh, tissues, and organ on a chip or microphysiological systems. Uh, we are increasing in, in phys physiological complexity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the limitation is that uh, we, we suffer in terms of throughput. So while 2D cell culture systems can be, can be high throughput in its uh, capabilities, um, the microphysiological systems is at best medium to low throughput. Now, in terms of uh, the use of non-human animal microphysiological systems, um, certainly this can be used to reduce, refine, replace animal use and research. Uh, evaluate environmental chemical effects on wildlife species, uh, advance animal health, uh, such as uh, in applications for veterinary research, uh, and, and then uh, as, as the subject of a recent uh, uh, National Academies workshop uh, to bridge animal and human data that will allow more robust translation and drug development uh, and regulatory applications of microphysiological systems data. Just to give you um, sort of like a, a, a general overview of what microphysiological systems are, these are essentially tissues or organoids um, uh, that consist of multiple uh, channel uh, microfluidic cell culture systems. Uh, as I've said, that emulates uh, major organ systems. So we have at least 10 major organ systems represented, the circulatory, the endo endocrine, GI, immune, skin, musculoskeletal, nervous, reproductive, respiratory, and urinary system. Um, and it takes um, uh, essentially uh, rep representing the tissues by taking into consideration the proper tissue scaffold, uh, the proper cell types, the ratios of the cells amongst each other. So this is not just a uh, monolayer or, or single uh, cell type, but multiple cell type representing the, the particular tissues. Uh, the structure, uh, the architecture of, of the tissues, spatial and temporal pa patterning, perfusion uh, by, by in including endothelial cells and, and vascular channels into the tissues, bioreactors that will allow uh, the cells to survive um, and be in culture for uh, multiple weeks, uh, innervation, immune host response, uh, functional readout and computational design. And, and obviously it will take uh, a lot of experts, interdisciplinary collaborations taking place to make this happen. So we have um, uh, teams involving material science, scientists, cell biologists, tissue engineers, biomedical engineers, um, microchip fabricators and manufacturers, microfluidic experts in anatomy and physiology, pharmacology, toxicology, omics, regulatory science and computational biology. Uh, now, going back again into the lung, uh, so this is a rendering of the lung. Again, to represent that, we, we go into the uh, basic functional unit of the lung, which are the air sacs, um, and, and this is the rendering of that. Uh, we have the vascular uh, vasculature uh, represented showing here uh, two micron beads, uh, fluorescent beads coursing through those microvasculature. Uh, this is work by Stephen George, um, and then this is work by uh, Jim Wells at Cincinnati. Uh, this is a gut enteroid that's been innervated, and it's showing peristalsis uh, in this particular um, video. Uh, and then we also incorporate uh, inline biosensing capabilities, whether it be microelectrode arrays, or in this particular case, uh, optogenetic uh, sensors. Um, that will show, uh, uh, in this particular case, hepatocytes undergoing apoptosis as a consequence uh, of radical oxygen species generation, so turning red uh, to green. 
So this, these are the actual chips themselves. So this is the chip, the, the lung on a chip, uh, this particular um, configuration. This would be the vasculature on a chip. This would be the GI uh, on a chip. It's also versatile. It also houses the kidney and the liver. Uh, this is work by uh, Teresa Woodruff, um, generating the female reproductive system on a chip that would have um, the female uh, reproductive organs, such as the fallopian tubes, ovary, uh, uterus, ectocervix, uh, and coupled with the liver. Um, and then this is a commercialized version of a 10 organ chip uh, commercialized by, by a company, a spin-off company, Hesperos. Uh, that has uh, multiple organs uh, represented in this particular platform. Uh, this is just a, a rendering of what has been funded uh, by NCATS and NIH uh, in the course of uh, 2012 to 2017. Essentially, the proof of concept that we can uh, in, uh, generate uh, multiple organ systems uh, all the way from uh, you know, uh, the blood-brain barrier, um, some of the liver uh, and, and kidney and, and, all, and muscles and bone. Um, and so a number of investigators uh, have worked uh, uh, tirelessly in, in being able to come up with uh, innovative solutions and, and uh, platforms that will house uh, individual organ systems and, and capture uh, its salient points in terms of functionality and, and response to uh, various perturbations. Um, so just to show you uh, an example, this is a data uh, generated by uh, Don Ingbar's group at the Wies Institute, uh, essentially showing um, the liver on a chip. And so this is actually comparing the rat liver on a chip with the human liver on a chip. Uh, and and this, in this particular case, uh, looking at the, the difference uh, in species response within the rat and, and human. Uh, and so this is looking at via uh, luridin, which is um, uh, an antiviral nucleoside analog uh, was withdrawn uh, during phase two clinical trial uh, because of toxicity. We're in about five out of the 15 patients that were treated um, uh, actually uh, uh, died and, and the cause of death was, was uh, microvesicular uh, accumulation uh, in terms of lipids uh, in the liver. And so looking at the uh, treatment at from zero to 30 uh, micromolars, uh, you can see that the rat as shown by Nile red staining uh, do not show any um, noticeable uh, effect. Whereas in the human liver on a chip, you can see that even at one micromolar, uh, you start seeing um, uh, vesicle accumulation uh, as quantitated here and as shown in, in this um, uh, uh, picture. Uh, commensurately, uh, one can also measure uh, physiological uh, uh, biomarkers, in this particular case, albumin concentration, uh, showing that uh, in the human liver on the chip, there is a, a decrease in albumin secretion uh, commensurate with the uh, loss of hepatocytes, whereas in the rat chip, um, one, one cannot observe such uh, differences. Uh, likewise, if you look at uh, known uh, liver biomarkers such as MIR-122, uh, glutathione S-transferase, and, and keratin, you also see uh, an, in an increase um, in, in accumulation of those markers uh, as a consequence of, of um, uh, those dependent uh, treatment of fialuridin. Uh, not only can, can we use the liver and the, uh, the, the chips to measure toxicity, but can also lead to mechanistic insights uh, into uh, toxicity. So in this particular case, uh, looking at the uh, aristolochic acid uh, metabolism. Uh, and so in this particular case, uh, the liver uh, on a chip was connected to the kidney and, and the neuro neurovascular unit, the gut, but what, what is important in this uh, functional connection of the various organ system is that uh, aristolochic acid, which is uh, an ingredient found in, in Chinese herb medicine, primarily used for weight loss, uh, show that it, it's actually nephrotoxic. Uh, but it's not known in terms of why nephrotoxicity happens. And so in this particular case, if you just uh, look at the kidney on a chip and treat it with um, 
uh, 10 micromolars erythrolocic acid, uh, no uh, nephrotoxicity is visible. Uh, whereas if the liver is connected to the kidney uh, and, and you, we see um, um, nephrotoxicity happening, um, so what happens is that the, the liver uh, uh, metabolizes the nephro, um, uh, the, the aristolochic acid uh, to form this alpha uh, uh, conjugated form, uh, which is, turns out to be the one, the active, uh, the, the active metabolite that is nephrotoxic uh, as shown here. Um, um, and by the live dead, uh, live dead uh, staining, um, and moreover, uh, you can prevent the uh, uh, kidney cells from, from dying, in this case, the proximal tubule cells, uh, by blocking the OAT4 transporter with probesonid, uh, as shown in this picture. Uh, so we, sh we show that the, the um, aristolochic acid can actually be blocked uh, and prevented from uh, accumulating proof from probesonid, and, and that the toxicity is due to uh, the liver metabolite. Uh, we also then, uh, uh, at the end of the proof of concept to show that the, that the chips can be used for uh, toxicity studies, uh, we then pivoted the program uh, to see if we can uh, develop um, these chips for disease modeling and efficacy testing. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the high rate of, of drug development failures because of the lack of efficacy. So uh, essentially creating uh, disease models that are more uh, relevant to human conditions. So this is an active program where we have a number of different uh, activities uh, ongoing uh, from uh, common to rare diseases um, uh, and, and also very complex diseases connecting multi-organ systems such as in the type two diabetes. Um, so, so a number of, of activities are being funded uh, right now to develop virus model systems uh, for diseases. Um, the, the chips have also been um, used to respond to various uh, health emergencies about two and a half years ago. Uh, the biggest crisis that our nation is, was facing was the, the opioid crisis still is uh, a, a big crisis. Uh, and so we were fortunate enough to get some, some money uh, from, through the HEAL, um, uh, which is the NIH uh, helping to end addiction long-term. And so in this case, uh, five awards uh, were given to model nociception, addiction, and overdose. Uh, and then with the uh, latest pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic through the CARES Act, we were able to get um, uh, money uh, through the uh, CARES Act uh, supplemental funding uh, to use chips uh, to uh, model COVID-19 infection, uh, to understand multiple tissue organ pathologies, uh, test candidate drugs and vaccines, understand immune response and model uh, complications for vulnerable and, and at-risk groups. Uh, moreover, uh, there is now uh, an active microphysiological systems COVID research uh, working group uh, primarily led by the uh, United Kingdom National Center for Replacement Refinement and Reduction, the NC3Rs, uh, with participation by uh, NIEHS, uh, NCATS, NIAID, FDA, and the, U and the U.S. Army. And, and some of the work that is coming out of this uh, funding, uh, again, uh, sh uh, this is work by, by Don Ingvar's group at the Visa Institute, um, showing how uh, the lung on a chip that which, which was being uh, used to study uh, COPD um, uh, was, was pivoted to now uh, be able to uh, work with COVID. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, they took uh, and compared um, uh, uh, cells uh, with uh, uh, infected with either SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus or VSV uh, pseudovirus particles and, and then treated them uh, with uh, FDA approved drugs. So in some, in some ways, antiviral uh, compounds and shows uh, for the most part that uh, in, in the STUDI system, um, you, can, you can see uh, prevention of, of viral entry uh, into the cells, into the lung uh, epithelial cells, uh, but in, in a, 3D a human airway chip, um, which is more physiological and has the biomechanics 
uh, of breathing, it's only the uh, amodiaquin and, and the uh, teremifin that showed uh, effectiveness in preventing viral entry. Um, so it shows that there's, there's quite a big difference between how you would evaluate uh, the effectiveness of a drug, uh, in this case, the antiviral uh, in a 2D cell culture system versus a 3D culture system. Uh, in, in this particular uh, slide, um, I'm showing the new initiatives uh, that NCATS is pursuing. Uh, in addition to the disease modeling, we are also uh, funding uh, a number of studies that started just last year. About 10 awards were issued uh, for clinical trials on chips, primarily to inform clinical trial design and implementation. Uh, and this is participated in by a number of institutes and centers at the NIH. Uh, we also have a collaboration with NASA uh, in terms of extending uh, the culture life of these tissue chips from the usual 28 days um, to be able to uh, expand the viability and robust function of these chips uh, for a minimum of six months. Um, and so this is actually a, a contract solicitation that, that just got published last week. Uh, so if anyone is interested in, in being able to test the limits of the system and be able to, to culture it out uh, uh, for more than six months, um, here's the site. Um, and then lastly, uh, NCATS is also very much interested in being able to establish an annual microphysiological systems uh, scientific conference that will be international in nature, uh, primarily to facilitate collaborative research, harmonization of regulatory standards and requirements, uh, the training of new investigators in this area, and certainly the coordination within funding agencies and regulatory agencies, and to foster sharing of data and, and resources. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to receive uh, several uh, meritorious applications uh, with one award uh, to be made in July of, of this year uh, for the most um, uh, scientifically meritorious application. Uh, just to give you a, a brief background on, on what the clinical trials on a chip program looks like, uh, again, um, this is more uh, looking at how we can inform clinical trial and design and execution by way of establishing recruitment criteria, uh, being able to stratify the patient population in terms who are going to be the best responders or non-responders, uh, as well as to develop clinically relevant biomarkers. Um, so in this particular case, um, uh, a number of the awards, as I mentioned, 10 awards were made uh, that will develop uh, and validate rare pediatric and common disease models uh, containing patient-derived cells, um, and so essentially uh, representing the patient demographics. Uh, and then um, it's a two-phase award. So the phase one is to create the models and, and then incorporate as many patient um, uh, populations as possible in, into several chips. And then phase two of the award would then be to uh, test potential drugs for efficacy and safety in, in assessment in clinical trials. And so these this drugs are either uh, looking at prospective or, or uh, concurrent uh, trials that are happening. And, and in one instance, being able to look retrospectively at a failed drug to see uh, why, why, the, uh, why that particular candidate drug failed in human trials. And so these are the various projects that are being supported in the clinical trials on a chip. Uh, it's gonna be running for another five years or so. Like I said, it's, uh, it's a biphasic award. It's, uh, so we're looking at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, atopic dermatitis, uh, dystrophin, muscular defic uh, deficient muscular dystrophy, uh, progeria, uh, tendon inflammation, uh, dementia, uh, heart diseases, kidney, um, um, preterm birth, as well as prostate cancer. Um, so these are the projects being uh, funded at this point. And now in terms of how, what we're doing uh, to increase the implementation uh, and adoption of this technology, um, this is the Gartner chart uh, for the hype cycle for emerging technologies, which generally measures uh, what it takes for adoption of a new technology uh, and for that to come into market. So these are sort of, sort of like the various uh, technologies uh, that are being watched uh, by this investment group. 
And so biochips came into, into the scene about 2013 and in, uh, right around this uh, the point here. And in 2018, this is where biochips are. Uh, and, and so essentially the goal is to reach the plateau of productivity in as short a time as possible. Uh, most new technologies takes uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 years for adoption. Um, and, and part of this is because of negative press that happens, uh, supplier consolidation and failures, second generation products and services that happens primarily in the, in the, in the area of the throw of disillusionment. Uh, and then in the slope of enlightenment, those who survive um, um, uh, the initial uh, disillusionment uh, will continue to develop standards, methodologies, and best practices, and third generation products uh, will be coming out and certainly most of this would be out of the box uh, products uh, suites. Um, and, and like I said, the goal is to reach the plateau of productivity where there's high growth adoption phase uh, and then greater than 30% potential uh, end users has adopted the innovation. And so what does it take to um, get to this uh, phase? Uh, we have essentially uh, three major challenges that's facing us uh, primarily new technology must meet market needs uh, so in, in this particular case, uh, we must uh, engage um, with the end users, uh, which primarily would be industry and regulatory agency. And then of course the end users uh, has to, sh to be able to uh, use it uh, easily and it has to be cost efficient. Uh, and so uh, uh, the next few slides will be um, addressing what we're doing to address these uh, challenges. Uh, so in this particular timeline, in terms of engagement with end users and multiple partners, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, the uh, organs on chips or tissues on chips program actually predated uh, the formation of NCATS uh, back in December 2011. Uh, this was started with funding from the Common Fund uh, through the Advanced, uh, Advancing Regulatory Science, uh, which is a partnership with NIH and FDA. Um, and then soon after NCATS were, was formed, we, we partnered with DARPA as well as with pharma companies to develop the toxicity models, uh, as I mentioned in the past uh, few slides. Um, and then uh, working towards uh, modeling diseases and um, in this particular case, uh, working with NASA to, uh, mod to develop models for accelerated aging models. Uh, which I'll go into a little bit of detail in, in, some, in the next uh, subsequent slides. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have uh, various other disease models for nociception, addiction, and overdose for Alzheimer's disease and, and the various disease models. Uh, but one of the uh, key areas in terms of investment is building confidence in, in these platforms. And so NCATS uh, essentially established uh, independent testing centers, uh, what we call tissue chip testing centers, which are independent, essentially laboratories uh, that have not worked with tissue chips before, uh, but would be looking to replicate uh, the findings of the tissue chip developers. Uh, and we also uh, funded uh, a database center that will house uh, all the data coming out of this program. Um, uh, what is, what is uh, inherent in, in the program is that the early engagement of uh, stakeholders, in this particular case, the uh, US uh, FDA has been involved from the beginning of the program and is currently still very engaged uh, in the program. And I'll uh, uh, have a few slides to show how engaged uh, the FDA is, as well as uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies in this case uh, working with the IQ Consortium, Microphysiological Systems Affiliate, uh, and the 24 or so uh, pharmaceutical companies that are have heavily uh, interested and in, in, in invested in, in seeing this uh, microphysiological systems uh, be adopted in, in drug development. Uh, in terms of uh, growing partnerships and investments beyond what NCATS is doing, um, as I mentioned, we have a number of, of partners within NIH. Uh, the Cancer Institute has a cancer biomimetics program, uh, NIMH, Nervous System Microphysiological Systems, NIDDK, uh, Modeling Diabetes, NIBIB, the Immune Chip, um, NINDS is models for Alzheimer's disease, 
blood brain barrier for NH NHLBI, bioinformatics for infectious diseases from NIAID, uh, and then next generation of MPS nervous system. Um, and, and also, uh, in, in some ways, uh, a mark of uh, a field that has matured sufficiently enough is when uh, the Center for Scientific Review at NIH uh, creates a dedicated study section uh, in, this, in this particular case, uh, CMT, uh, to uh, review uh, uh, grant applications coming into NIH uh, that will go uh, into this uh, dedicated study section. We have also partnered with NASA, as I mentioned, uh, with, uh, through workshops, and, and as I mentioned, through this contract solicitation for uh, establishing tissue chips that will uh, be in culture for more than six months. Uh, there's been a number of partners as well and presence uh, uh, in Europe, uh, Eurox, Organ and a Chip, NC3Rs, as I mentioned, HDMT, uh, Japan, AMED is also funding as well as Korea and China, uh, as, and Australia has also been uh, working on, on it and various, various platforms. Um, and also work with uh, partnerships with other agencies, funding agencies such as BARDA, the TRISH, uh, NASA Human Research Program. Uh, the EPA is primarily interested because of uh, their mandate to be animal to, to be animal free testing by 2035. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, the VA, the Veterans Affairs, um, as well as the recent workshop that we had with the National Academies and ILAR. Uh, on microphysiological systems for One Health and comparative medical research. Uh, these are uh, a number of uh, companies that have either uh, uh, spun out or have been established, uh, centered around uh, organs on chips and organoid technology. Uh, a number of these companies have um, uh, gotten NIH support to the small business programs. And it allows for the democratization of the technology platforms, which allows essentially uh, pharma and other end users to choose from at least um, uh, 20 companies for CRO-like services uh, or, or the ability to purchase uh, the platforms and, and other consumables, uh, either uh, and as well as the cells uh, in these platforms. In terms of building confidence, I, I mentioned uh, the tissue chip uh, validation centers. Uh, so in this case, we, we see the um, validation uh, essentially in terms of three steps, uh, physiological validation, uh, which is replicating organ function and structure uh, as well as response. And we do this with a training set of reference compounds obtained from pharma. Uh, and this uh, validate, physiological validation is essentially done by the tissue chip developers and has resulted in more than 500 publications as of October 2017. Uh, the second level of validation uh, would be the analytical uh, validation, and this is uh, done by the tissue chip testing centers, uh, which are independent sites and are primarily looking at uh, robustness, reproducibility, reliability, and relevance of the chips. And this is with uh, a different set of compounds um, uh, validation set of compounds uh, recommended by FDA and the IQ consortium, as well as biomarkers and assays and, and the tissue chip testing centers um, that we have funded uh, would be MIT and Texas A&M University. And as I mentioned, the microphysiological systems database uh, that is housed, currently housed at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, the final stage of validation would be the industrial uh, phase, uh, which were in industry and regulatory agencies start using the system. Um, and this is uh, uh, pre presumably done with pro proprietary set of compounds uh, in a CRO type environment. So in order to uh, promote this, uh, we have encouraged our testing centers to uh, be self-sustaining. And so they have actually spun out. Um, so the MIT uh, is now Javelin Biotech. Uh, which is uh, a CRO business model, and Texas A&M uh, became the tissue chip testing consortium. And, and sh that should allow um, uh, other uh, stakeholders and end users to, to form collaborative activities uh, with other end users uh, to see what, what platform is, is best used. And we can certainly continue to support the, uh, the database uh, to be able to uh, make the data publicly available. And so this is what the database looks like. 
uh, that is housed at University of Pittsburgh. So essentially it takes microphysiological systems data as shown here, um, and also uh, brings in preclinical data from animals and, and other 2D models, clinical data, uh, some of the um, drugs that have been tested uh, in, in a lot of these systems through Campbell and Unicam and Drug Bank, uh, and then bringing in other databases and essentially integrating this um, to be able to uh, come up with analytical tools that will be able to show uh, reproducibility um, and be able to, to um, predict the safety and efficacy of drugs uh, and have computational uh, tools uh, for disease modeling uh, that is available uh, at this, in this database. Uh, one of the things that we have um, uh, pondered about is, is whether it's possible to, to model age-related disorders uh, given the short uh, shelf life of these chips and, and the months or years it takes to model age-related disorders. Um, and some of these changes, of course, are my, my musculoskeletal uh, changes, uh, GI conditions, cardiovascular changes, respiratory changes, renal uh, decline in immune response uh, and decline in visual acuity. And so can we model age-related diseases on tissue chips? Can we develop drugs to mitigate age-related diseases? And who are the right partners to engage? And so as it turns out, uh, when, when astronauts um, go up in space and get exposed to prolonged microgravity, there are certain physiological changes that happens uh, in, in, in their bodies that mimic um, accelerated aging. So within three weeks of uh, being exposed to microgravity, they have upper body fluid shift, neurovestibular disturbances, sleep disturbances, bone demineralization. Uh, and within six months, they have bone resorption, muscle atrophy, um, GI uh, disturbances, hematological changes, um, and then uh, anything and anyone spending uh, more than six months in space uh, can undergo uh, immune senescence, renal stone formation. Uh, but the interesting thing is that when, when the astronauts uh, return to Earth, uh, they re revert back uh, within a few months to, to normal physiology. Um, and so uh, having this background, we then uh, NCATS partner with NASA uh, and the Center for Advancement of Science and Space and the International Space Station National Laboratory uh, to be able to see if we can um, address some of these uh, uh, issues of being able to model age-related diseases under microgravity. So essentially we have two goals. One is, can we model age-related diseases uh, by bringing them under microgravity on, on tissue chips? Um, and so we have actually funded uh, a number of projects that would look at immune senescence, sarcopenia, osteoarthritis, cardiac dysfunction, blood brain permeability changes, proteinuria and kidney stone formation, lung infection, bone marrow and immune response, uh, and gut inflammation. Uh, and the second goal that we have is that uh, in order to adopt the technology here on Earth, I, I mentioned one of the challenges is ease of use and cost efficiency. Well, as it turns out, uh, there is a requirement um, by NASA and, and in this particular case, the SpaceX, um, uh, in terms of what it takes for the payload to go up into space. And so we, we have to transform uh, essentially a refrigerator size uh, incubator size, you know, and like an incubator that houses, you know, in this particular case, 24 chips um, to be able to uh, bring that up into the International Space, Space Station, NASA and SpaceX uh, requires that it be reduced or miniaturized to uh, from 48 cubic feet uh, to 1.6 1, 1 cubic feet. Um, and so we were able to do this uh, through partnerships with NASA, uh, SpaceX uh, and some of the implementation partners, space implementation partners, TechChat, Space Tango, and Bioserve uh, to be able to um, uh, reduce this contraption to something the size of a shoebox. Um, and so we were able to uh, fund, as I mentioned, a number of these projects um, shown here, immunosenescence, osteoarthritis, blood-brain barrier, proteinuria and kidney stone formation, lung infection, uh, cardiac uh, disorders, muscle wasting, or sarcopenia and in gut in, uh, inflammation in the microbiome. And so um, 
uh, there's been a number of, uh, to show that we were able to not only uh, miniaturize, but also automate the technology because the astronauts are not um, necessarily scientists. So they, they, one of the requirements is that it not only is miniaturized, but it should be turnkey technology. And so we were able to, um, our first launch was in, in 2018, uh, uh, sending up the immunosenescence on the chip. Uh, and this was followed by subsequent launches uh, through SpaceX 17, uh, 2021. Uh, and actually later today um, at 1.29 PM, we will have a payload going up uh, through SpaceX 22 uh, that will study kidney stone formation uh, at the International Space Station. Uh, now switching gears, uh, this will be uh, in terms of what uh, FDA and pharma uh, a status on the uptake of microphysiological systems. And so the FDA has actually formed an, uh, an alternative methods working group, uh, which has a web, web page presence in terms of indicating what their priorities are. They have a webinar series and alternative methods. Uh, this is participated in by various centers within the FDA by CEDAR, CBER, uh, and SIPSPAN. Uh, so Center for Tobacco Products and Medi Medical Countermeasures have also funded microphysiological systems uh, for specific applications, such as looking at the effects of e-cigarettes and hookah on the lung. Um, they have, moreover, uh, FDA has uh, established an, uh, a new pilot program called iStand, uh, which uh, uh, is, represents uh, innovative science and technology approaches for new drugs, uh, which is uh, in some ways a way to, to fast track or to evaluate how new technologies such as microphysiological systems can be considered as a novel drug uh, development tools. Um, and then microphysiological systems um, was also highlighted as one of the emerging technologies and focus of several sessions at the 2020 Global Summit for Regulatory Science. In terms of pharma, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've been working with the IQ MPS affiliate um, it consists of 24 pharma companies um, uh, representing drug safety, 3Rs, ADME, and PKPD. Um, this group of uh, uh, representatives from various pharma companies have co-authored a series of publications um, on, on what it takes for industry to, to adopt uh, the technology and the type of context of use that they would like microphysiological systems to be used for. Uh, in particular for li liver, kidney, lung, GI, skin, and cardiovascular um, platforms. Uh, so these publications can be found on their website uh, and they have uh, a series of other articles uh, soon to be published on disease modeling, ocular toxicity, oligonucleotide, cell therapy, uh, gene editing, blood brain barrier, CNS, immune system, reproductive system, and what, what they're looking for uh, in terms of how microphysiological systems can be can be adopted for use in, the, in this fields. Uh, so these are a representation of some, of some of the publications that have already gone out, the, the eight or so publications that I mentioned uh, that can be found at, at the IQ MPS affiliate website. Uh, more importantly, the um, uh, pharmaceutical companies have also started using microphysiological systems for internal portfolio decision-making. Uh, and so these are just some of the organ systems being used uh, heavily by industry, the type of areas that they're using them primarily with target identification, lead optimization, preclinical safety, uh, preclinical efficacy, and PKA and, and, and toxicokinetics as well. And, and some of the publications have gone out and, and these are some of the companies uh, that have been working on these systems. Um, just in terms of what we're looking for metrics for success in this program. Uh, so essentially the tr transformative outcomes that we're looking for will be uh, therapeutic areas of IND submissions containing chip data, identification com compounds with high likelihood of ADRs and compounds that are designated as safe, uh, establishment of a standard for quality and predictability and reproducibility compared with animal models and, and, and human studies. Um, reduction uh, in the speed of uh, development of drugs uh, and reduction in failure, um, integration of, and use of organs or, um, and tissue chip 
as part of compound selection, uh, reduction in various adverse events in human studies, uh, refinement reduction and potential replacement in animal testing, uh, industry and regulatory adoption of the technology. Um, there's also been a recent survey uh, of 15 pharma experts uh, that forecasted that within the next five years or so, uh, microphysiological systems, uh, once adopted in, into the pharma pipeline, could save between 10% to 26% of R&D cost. In terms of uh, driving uh, cultural change, um, you know, I, as I mentioned, we have an inclusive strategy for adoption and application. Uh, where we actively engage funding agencies, regulators, industry, academics, and tissue chip developers uh, to col collaborate and work closely uh, to address a number of issues. Um, some of the issues, of course, that, that we work with uh, will, you know, will rodent pilot studies still be required? Can non-human primates uh, PK experiments uh, be reduced or replaced? Uh, what will in vitro only approaches look like for entry into human testing? Uh, will data in two species still be required or will tissue chips be sort of like a, a third species requirement? What is the best use of omics-based readouts and how can this be done with in silico approaches and data science? Um, and so these are just some of the, the, the things that we have done in terms of working pre-competitively uh, through data sharing with pharma, uh, through the database, uh, working with the IQ consortium, uh, regulators, uh, working uh, potentially with, with pharma uh, to create through the ISTAN program, so like a, a safe harbor type environment, um, and then being able to um, have uh, expected transformative outcomes, including being able to enable prosecution of human-only targets emerging from gen genomics initiatives. Uh, as you know, uh, more and more of therapies, whether it be ASOs, uh, somatic cell gene editing are, are heavily focused on, on either human-only targets or human sequence uh, guided um, uh, dependent uh, strategies uh, that will require um, human-like uh, uh, or, or representing human cells, at least, uh, in some of the initiatives. Uh, also, substantial time and savings and replacement of existing screens. Uh, being able to stratify patients for clinical trials, identify subpopulations that may need dose modification, and predict the response of particular patients and risk for adverse events. Uh, now, switching gears um, uh, uh, and, and going from microphysiological systems to mimicking dogs' olfactory systems, many of you know, probably know, that dogs have about 220 million scent receptors. Uh, whereas humans only have 5 million, dogs have smell receptors 10,000 times more accurate uh, than humans, uh, which means their nose is powerful enough to detect substances at concentrations of one part per, per trillion, uh, which means that it can detect uh, a single drop of a compound or liquid in a 20 Olympic sized swimming pools. Uh, dogs can also inhale up to 300 times per minute in short breath. Uh, meaning that their olfactory cells are constantly supplied with new odor particles for volatile organic compounds. Um, so dogs, so in the, in the light of this, dogs have been trained to sniff out explosives, narcotics, uh, for, and for search and rescue, and to detect diseases such as cancer, Parkinson's, onset of epileptic seizures, or, or nar narcoleptic moment, low blood sugar, migraine, malaria, uh, and even COVID-19. Uh, however, there are limitations, obviously, in the use of dogs for uh, detection. Uh, there are uh, a variation between breeds, within breeds, and between individual dogs. Uh, training can be expensive, time-consuming, and it's not easily scalable and has to be maintained so that the dog doesn't lose their ability um, to detect these conditions. And so NCATS then um, created a new program recently uh, for scanning for called SENT, uh, which stands for Scanning for Conditions for Electronic with Electronic Nose Technology. So our goal is to develop a non-invasive diagnostic device for rapid and accurate diagnosis for a variety of medical conditions, uh, and it will be using volatile organic compounds uh, released through the skin as the key substrate. Uh, and to be able to establish a catalog of uh, volatile organic compound signatures unique for each disease. Uh, so we have an RFA that's out there right now, um, screening, um, uh, uh, 
uh, and we're, we're uh, looking for applications to be submitted. Uh, we've actually piloted this program uh, uh, a year ago uh, where we changed the C uh, scanning for COVID-19 with electronic nose technology uh, because we were fortunate enough to be able to get some Red X uh, money uh, to be able to pilot this program. And so we have issued four awards uh, looking at volatile organic compounds from breath and skin uh, to be able to detect um, uh, vox or volatile uh, compounds from skin or breath uh, that will pick up um, signatures of uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, be able to um, acquire uh, the signal uh, and through data processing, artificial intelligence, and machine learning be able to then recognize those patterns and be able to come up with the diagnostics. And so with that, I'll, I'll end uh, with some acknowledgements, uh, primarily uh, capable uh, people that I work with, uh, my program managers, Lucy Lowe and Pasley Hargrove Grimes, uh, a number of program officers from various institutes and centers at the NIH, our collaborations with FDA, uh, with in the International Space Station, NASA and IQ, uh, and then for the SENT program, uh, my, my program officer, Leia Telosa Croucher, and Sharice Johnst Johnston as the program analyst. Uh, so with that, I'll end and be able to uh, take any questions.